Hello and thank you for joining us today for Hamilton Thorne's webinar, Benefits of Using Lasers in Clinical Applications, and an in-depth discussion on vitrification in assisted reproduction. The webinar can be viewed in full screen mode, so if you choose this setting, the button is displayed at the top left side of your monitor or on your control panel. There are also a few videos in this presentation, so we recommend that you close out any additional applications on your computer to provide for smoother viewing. The webinar will be conducted in three parts, followed by a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. You can provide your questions throughout the webinar, and during the Q&A session, we will have our panel of experts answer as many questions as time allows. Any questions that we are not able to address during the live session, we will send a follow-up email to you directly with an answer. The first session of the webinar will be led by Tom Kenny, Vice President of Engineering at Hamilton Thorne, who will be providing an overview of our laser systems and clinical procedures, such as assisted hatching and blastomere trophectoderm biopsy for preimplantation genetic diagnosis, also known as PGD. After Tom's talk, we'll take a quick poll and share the results with the audience. Next, we will have our guest speaker, Dr. Jurgen Lieberman, Laboratory Director of FCI's Chicago River North IVF Lab, who will share his laboratory's results on how Hamilton Thorne lasers can be successfully used to improve the vitrification process. Finally, David Wolf, Hamilton Thorne's President and CEO, will moderate the question and answer session. With that, I turn the talk over to Tom Kenny to provide an overview on HT's laser products and clinical procedures. Tom? Well, hello and welcome to the webinar. My name is Tom Kenny. I'm the Vice President of Engineering at Hamilton Thorne. And um, we'd like to provide a brief overview of our laser technology, how it works, um, clinical applications such as laser-assisted hatching, uh, laser-assisted biopsy for PGD. Um, we'll get into the differences between the two lasers that Hamilton Thorne makes, the Xylos DK and the Lycos. Uh, as well as then finally talk about the advantages of the new multipulse features that we have. So first let's talk about the laser. How does it work? Um, you know, you hear about lasers and you wonder, well, how is it actually doing the job it's doing? Our laser and the lasers used in uh, the Xylos and Lycos are an infrared laser. It means that they're basically heat. And the laser, if you look at the picture on the screen here, the laser is actually the size of the red circle in the center and it never gets any bigger than the red circle in the center. The laser's wavelength, or the color of the laser being infrared, is absorbed very, very strongly by water. This is the same as uh, thinking about the sun on a very hot day, and you look at a black car or a white car, and the black car gets very, very hot, and you touch it and you can burn your hand, but a white car stays very cold. So water absorbs the infrared radiation from these lasers very strongly, just like the black car would in the sun. And so we can heat up the, um, the channel um, where the laser is firing and conduct heat into the surrounding area. So you'll notice the little isotherm rings, which are those colored rings. We can make larger or smaller holes, not by increasing the power of the laser, but by just turning it on for either a longer or shorter time. So the longer you turn it on, the more energy gets conducted into the uh, water and the media, and the zona pellucida is highly comprised of water. So it absorbs the energy, and then the laser, once it hits about 140 degrees C, which is the orange ring, the ring just next to the red, uh, that will usually thermally lyse the membrane of the zona pellucida. So that would be hatching in that case. So the diameter of the laser beam is about 4 microns. Um, we can adjust the pulse lengths to pulse length, sorry, to determine different uh, size of holes. Uh, the maximum power we use is 300 milliwatts. Above that, you can run into some funky things that happen. And we can adjust the pulse length from 0 to 3,000 microseconds. Ah, here we have a slide showing the temperatures associated with those isotherm rings. So that's one of our target indicators when you look on the monitor. Uh, and you'll be able to see what is the heating effect of that particular pulse. And it sounds sometimes that, you know, if you think 50 degrees C is going to extend out that far, that that might be dangerous. But remember, it's for a very, very short period of time. Uh, much like I like to say, taking your finger, and uh, some people might take your hand, and you can run your finger across the top of a candle flame, and you don't burn your finger. 
It's because you haven't actually held it in front of the flame for long enough to burn your finger. Um, if you hold your finger five inches or ten centimeters or so above the candle flame, you will burn your finger after uh, even three or four seconds. Uh, and so time has a big component into the uh, effect of the laser. And uh, as you can see, the longer time you turn it on for, the larger the rings get, uh, and those are the colors. The colors indicate what temperature will be achieved at that particular uh, radius from the laser itself. Here we can see um, a split screen. So on the right, there's um, what uh, Jerome Conier told me was an electron microscope picture of uh, the laser which is passed by the zona pellucida making a trench. So if you look at the bottom of that little right-hand area, you can see a 2D image of a cell with a, a hole cut in the zona pellucida. What it's actually doing is that 3D picture. It's actually carving a trench down the side. Uh, much like if you took a curved knife and cut down the side of an orange, you'd actually cut up part of the peel. So when you do a ablation for hatching or for biopsy, you're actually making this trench down the side. Uh, on the left, we talk a little bit about the way that the infrared energy is absorbed in the water. So what actually happens is that the hydrogens uh, have different vibrational modes where they either stretch with respect to the oxygen or sometimes bend back and forth. Um, and at any rate, that it's that bending and stretching and, and getting excited, if you will, that uh, causes the water to heat up because they are absorbing the uh, energy from the laser. Here we can see some of the clinical applications that um, the lasers, the uh, xylos and glycos, are used for right now. Um, single pulse localized region. Um, if you look on the left picture at the bottom, you can see uh, what would be a typical assisted hatching where you just make a small breach in the zona, typically day three as you can see, and um, then on day five you typically find uh, the herniated um, troph uh, trophoblast uh, cells uh, herniating out. The center image is a blastomere biopsy where they've actually cut a fairly large hole there, but the um, you would go in and pull one cell out, typically to do pre-implantation genetic diagnostics, and um, uh, get your results back. And you would, uh, let's say, know on day five uh, whether or not uh, to transfer that uh, embryo or not. Uh, more recently, there's been uh, a lot of people interested in performing trophectoderm biopsy. And uh, these lasers are cleared for doing trophectoderm biopsy, uh, especially since you can now vitrify with success uh, blast stage embryos. So on the right side, you can see where the laser would be used to actually go down and interrupt the gap junctions um, in the uh, cells, the trophoblast cells. And we'll get into that a little bit more. Here you can see a video, um, and when the laser is fired, the target is turned off for just a second, and it comes back on after it shows you where the hole was made. And uh, this is Barry Bear. He's fantastic at this, uh, doing a blastomere biopsy, a day three typically blastomere biopsy. You notice he makes a fairly small hole in the uh, zona, goes in and in aspirates out one cell, which would then be sent off for pre-implantation genetic diagnostics. Diagnosis. Looks like you can actually see the nucleus there. So a nice video. Uh, here is a video showing trophectoderm biopsy where the laser is used, and we're using it in single pulse now. So in this case, you're pressing the foot switch or firing the laser one pulse at a time. Um, and they haven't started yet. They're just about to do it. You might see a little tick every so often when the laser goes off. What's happening here is you're not trying to cut the cells apart as much as you are trying to interrupt those gap junctions between those cells so that you can um, dictate where those cells will separate. So you apply um, uh, suction on your holding pipette on the left, which you can't see. You've got your aspiration pipette on the right. And you would just sort of stretch out a little bit and use the laser to, again, uh, just with, with low energy, try to interrupt the gap junctions of those cells and dictate where they'll, uh, where they'll pull apart. Now, this is a picture of the two Hamilton Thorne um, lasers. On the left is the older Xylos TK laser, which is tried and true. Uh, on the right is the new Lycos. 
and you'll notice that the lycos is a lot slimmer. Uh, so the xyloscape, they, they both lasers work exactly the same way, but the xylos sometimes can take up an extra port on your microscope and um, uh, not allow you to use as many objectives, whereas the lycos is a uh, smaller diameter and um, allows you to use all your ports. It's all pre-focused. They both give beautiful images and uh, do the job that you need to get done. Here we can take a look at a schematic diagram of what's happening inside the laser. So let's look at the left first, and you'll see the two blue items on the left. The leftmost one is actually the laser diode, and it would actually produce this uh, a beam of laser energy coming out, which is then captured by a lens, which is the second blue device to the right, and produce a parallel beam of light going to the right into the optical path, so then uh, this would sit on top of your turret. The beam would then go straight up through that small objective and be focused down to a waist or a thin place, which is going to be at the embryo. So as you see it get very thin above that objective, that's where you're going to place your embryo. And so we focus the laser and all, align it uh, so that it's all um, uh, creating a nice thin waist, that 4 micron beam right at the embryo. Now these laser beam alignment optics are very, very critical. If you don't have those beams, if you don't have that beam, that gray beam lined up exactly uh, with the center line of your optics, uh, going straight up, not at angles or anything, you can get um, a laser beam which is not a 4 micron, uh, very uh, intense beam, which is what you want. Uh, but you can actually spread that out and get um, odd effects, which uh, could have uh, you know, detri uh, detrimental effects on uh, nearby blastomeres or uh, other things that you don't want. So it's very, very important for these pre-aligned, we think anyway, to have these pre-aligned optics. So all of these laser optics are uh, done inside a package, and then all you do is screw it onto your nose piece turret on your microscope. On the right side, you can see that we've taken the, and, and here the, laser beam optics are the red beam, which start on the left, they actually go downward through a little lens, bend in off a mirror, and then bend upward towards the target. Um, and again, those are all pre-aligned in our optics laboratory here at Hamilton Thorne, so that uh, you get perfect laser alignment, uh, and it does not have to be done in scope. On the right side, I'm sorry, go back to the previous slides, there we go. On the right side, you can see um, a new feature called red eye. So we had a lot of people asking to be able to see a red spot indicator in the eyepieces. And we've done this by using the back side of that dichroic mirror, that 45 degree angle mirror that's in there. And we bounce a, a beam going back towards your eyes. Now this is not a, it's very important to know that this is not a laser. It's just an LED, a light emitting diode. It's very, very safe. It's just like the little LEDs you see on your cell phone or uh, the monitor on your computer and so forth. So. Uh, it's very safe, and it provides a target indicator in your eyepieces now where you can actually see where the laser is going to fly, and it's perfectly focused. Um, so you'll see a perfect little re round red dot. Uh, you line up the place that you want to do the laser ablation or the trifectoderm uh, biopsy and so forth, and um, press the foot switch, and it's very, very quick and effective. Thanks. Here you can see a couple of um, uh, nice this is a good slide, actually. So on the left, you'll see where a laser could be mounted to the back of the microscope. And in this case, your microscope itself, the body of your microscope, is part of the laser alignment, which means that if that laser on the back, and we used to actually make a laser about 1998, which fit into the center area underneath. And your microscope was then part of that laser alignment optics. So we couldn't align the laser beam here at the optics laboratory. We had to do it on microscope in the field. And um, that, that, you know, if the, again, if the laser is not lined up properly, that can cause problems. On the right side, you can see actually a picture of the Xylos CK, uh, and it's much smaller. It's, it, everything's integrated into one package, and all those laser optics are pre-aligned at the um, laser optics factory here. So what's the difference between the Xylos TK and the Lycos? Uh, they both use the same wavelength, about the same power. Both of the laser beam optics are aligned here in the uh, optics lab. Um, they're compatible with most inverted microscopes. In fact, I haven't found a microscope yet that we can't put this on. 
Uh, you notice that since we mount to the objective turret, we don't have to have a fluorescent scope. You could have a very inexpensive scope and still use it, or yet you could use the biggest and uh, most expensive microscope in the world and still put it on there. So it really doesn't matter. It's just an objective design when it comes to that. Uh, they're both infinity corrected. Uh, if you're using an older diaphod or non-infinity corrected microscope, the xyls k can actually be manually refocused for those older non-infinity scopes. Uh, you'll notice that the Lycos has red eye standard on it and the Xylos doesn't, uh, as well as the multi-pulse feature. And we'll get into the, how the multi-pulse feature works in a minute, but the Lycos comes standard with multi-pulse and the Xylos DK does not have it available. Uh, either laser system, when we talk about the whole system, uh, you have a choice of either a digital or an analog camera. You can choose a desktop or a laptop PC to run the system as well. So multipulse, what is multipulse? Multipulse is like a machine gun, but we don't want to think about it as, uh, you know, a Sylvester Stallone or something going at the embryo with a machine gun. The idea is that when you're doing perfected derm biopsy, you want to be able to get that separation of defective derm biopsy cells done as quickly as possible, get that um, uh, embryo back into the incubator as quickly as you can. So what we've done is enabled you to, with the foot switch, hold the foot switch down and allow the laser to then fire a train of pulses. So it would go tick, 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 and it would just continue to fire until you lift the foot switch up as you draw the trifectoderm cells in front of the laser. This provides a much quicker way to uh, separate those trifectoderm cells and um, get the embryo back into the incubator where it really wants to be. So it's available on the Lycos. You get the intense local heat for just a brief period. Um, you, you can see it says now there's 10 milliwatt maximum uh, mean limit. So the CW equivalent would be about 10 milliwatts. Typically, you don't even need uh, anything near that. You can get away with as little as one milliwatt, believe it or not, um, of energy, which you know is, is very, very small compared to what that laser could do. Um, and it does uh, weaken the gap junctions and allows you to separate um, the uh, director germ cells. And this is cleared by um, FDA and has an MDD and a CE mark as well. Uh, here we can see uh, an early video of using multi-pulse to separate uh, trophoblast cells on a mouse embryo. And uh, it's much quicker than um, trying to do it with a single pulse at a time. This was done by a great guy, uh, Dr. Walid Malouf, over at uh, Nottingham. So in summary, the clinical applications that we have available right now would be laser-assisted hatching, blastomere biopsy, trifectoderm biopsy. Um, the things that we think are very important are these pre-aligned laser optics. Uh, that really does help to create a very safe and effective and um, easy to use laser system. So uh, they can be portable. You can take this laser with a laptop and move it from lab to lab. We have people that uh, are traveling embryologists that go around with the laser and uh, actually work in multiple labs. Uh, so because of that pre-aligned optics, you don't need to spend a lot of time with a technician getting everything lined up on your scope. So again, very easy, safe, and um, uh, very effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. At this time, we're going to take a quick poll of the audience. Today's poll question is do you use any method of artificial collapse prior to blastocyst vit vitrification? Please choose one response. Great, thank you. I'll now close the poll and share the results. It, looked like, it looks like about 51% of you uh, do use artificial collapse prior to blastocyst vitrification, while about 18% plan to use it in the future. 
And now I'll turn the microphone over to Dr. Jurgen Lieberman, Laboratory Director of FCI's Chicago River North IVF Lab, who will be giving a talk on how lasers can be successfully used to improve the vitrification process. Dr. Lieberman, please pr proceed with your presentation. Good morning, everyone, to part two of this webinar, where I would like to share our results in implementing artificial collapsing prior to vitrification. And before I start to present some data, I want to show you what we as an IVF center here in Chicago have experienced in vitrifying plastics since 2004. So far we vitrified more than 17,000 plastics from 4,500 patients and uh, we have about, uh, we did about 3,100 embryo transfers with a frozen blastocyst day 5, day 6. So far, we vitrify about 50, 50 percent uh, day 6, day 5 blastocysts and a minority less than 3 percent on day 7. After so many uh, transfers, we can uh, look back to more than 1,000 babies born from uh, vitrified blastocyst transfers and our gender population is about 527 females to 513 males, so uh, it's an even number of both genders. We have about 77% singleton and a little bit more than 20% twins. So the data I want to show you is a retrospective analysis by looking at day 5 and day 6 transfers of frozen vitrified blastocysts. So today, for most of you, it's clear that vitrification of human blastocysts provides an excellent outcome. I don't think we have every other stage of embryos where we can achieve this outcome using frozen embryos. But even though good quality embryos on day six were vitrified, at least in our hands, the outcome was unsatisfying low compared to the outcome we achieved by using day five blastocysts. And however, a big water field cavity called the blastocyst needs to be dehydrated prior vitrification. And some embryos simply don't collapse during these dehydration steps. However, a successful dehydration of the cell is required to provide a sufficient access of the cryoprotectant inside the cell. And one way to support the replacement of the water by the cryoprotectant seems to be in the reduction of the cavity by artificially collapsing of the blastocyst. So to see if we could improve the outcome, and first we looked at day six, we implemented artificial collapsing prior the vitrification steps. So we started in 2011 and we applied artificial collapsing to day six blastocyst prior vitrification and based on the results we achieved by implementing this single step we would extend this to day five blastocysts. And when we compared this data with our day five, day six blastocysts we did in the past where no artificial collapsing was applied. This is the sequence of uh, slides uh, and I have to thank you my friend and colleague Dr. Mukaida and it's published also in the book Vitrification in Assisted Reproduction and if you follow the slides from A to F it shows you how you actually adjust your laser, you shoot one pulse and how finally the, the blastocyst is collapsing after this laser pulse. Here are three pictures uh, done by ourselves. You locate your laser uh, to two trophectoderm cells, a junction between two trophectoderm cells. Then you use a power of 500 microseconds and uh, when you're done with your shot, you put the incubators back, the blastocyst back in the incubator for about five to 10 minutes and uh, then the blastocyst will be collapsed and you can start to vitrify them. For uh, vitrification, you need a special carrier system and we use since 2007 a uh, closed carrier system, it's called High Security Vitrification Kit, it's uh, produced in France and it is um, FDA cleared since 2010 and a solution for vitrifying blastocysts as well as warming 
we use an Irvine kit containing 7% ethylene glycol dimethyl of sulfoxide with a final rectification solution of 15% of ethylene glycol dimethyl sulfoxide and 0.5 molar sucrose. So the vitrification is done in two steps, starting with 7.5% and uh, finally with 15%. When we load and seal the carrier and after sealing the carrier, we plunge the carrier containing the embryos in liquid nitrogen. If the patient is prepared for an embryo transfer using these frozen blastocysts, the environment of the blastocyst is performed in three steps. We starting with one molar sucrose, moving the cells in 0.5 molar sucrose, and finally in wash solution uh, without any sucrose. Uh, all sealed uh, high security vitrification kits were secondarily stored inside 5 ml liquid nitrogen pre-filled canes. Assisted hatching for all warm blastocysts was performed, except those were hatching on their own. Blastocysts usually were warming before one, two hours uh, prior transfer. For the preparement of the endometrium, natural as well as hormone replacement cycles were used. Progesterone was supplemented on day 15 of the cycle and blastocysts were warmed on day 6 of progesterone supplementation. These slides shows you how we set up our vitrification slide to vitrify the blastocysts. And we usually put them first in the wash solution that is modified HDF or M199 with 10% uh, protein. And when we connect drop 1 and 2 and the second drop contains already 7.5% uh, equilibration solution. We connect these drops for 5 minutes and then we move the cells to uh, a drop with uh, again 7.5% percent and we keep the cells there for additional three minutes so we expose them during equilibration for about eight minutes and after these eight minutes these cells actually ready to move them to the final or through the final vitrification solution of 15 percent in about 60 seconds. And this is a diagram of the warming dish we set up uh, we start with uh, one molar sucrose at 37 degrees Celsius. Then we move the cells to a dish on a room temperature bench and we connect the one molar drop in blue to the yellow drops containing 0.5 molar. And the whole procedure has a purpose to decrease here the concentration of the sucrose to allow a re-expansion of the blastocysts. If you look at the time frame for vitrification, it takes about 9 to 10 minutes for the vitrification for the warming procedure. If we summarize the time we need to expose the cells to sucrose, it's about 15 to 16 minutes. So this is our, with our results. Um, we have uh, 1,482 transfers in group A. And as a reminder, group A is a group we didn't perform artificial collapsing. The mean age is about 35.3. And we can look back to 863 day 5 transfers and 619 day 6 transfers. Group B, that's actually our study group where we performed artificial collapsing. We have so far 239 transfers, same age as in group A. We have 109 day 5 transfers and 130 day 6 transfers. This is our uh, post shows you our post warming performance. We didn't see any difference in the recovery. We didn't see any difference in survival of the blastocysts. Uh, but we saw a significant improvement in all outcome parameters. For example, in clinical pregnancies, uh, we went up from 33% and this is a cycle where we didn't apply artificial collapsing to 63. The same trend of course you can observe in the ongoing pregnancy where we started with 35% to 58% and the implantation from 32% went up to 45.5 and this data combined day 5 and day 6 blastocysts. If you look at the outcome 
and here the first slide will be the clinical outcome per age and uh, the first columns are oocyte donation cycles and then the age uh, groups per SART register. Uh, in the donor group we were able to improve the clinical pregnancy from 41 up to 55. In the younger patients under 35, the good prognosis patient population, we even improved from 48 to 71.5. And if you follow the age until the older patients, older than 40, you still were able to improve from 27% before without collapsing to 46%. The next slide shows you the ongoing pregnancy, again, oocyte donation cycles and uh, the age groups. And you observe the same trend as you saw in the clinical pregnancy. For example, in the younger patients, we improved from 41 to 69 percent patients under 35. If you go to patients to 38 to 40, we started with 28 percent ongoing pregnancy and we were able to improve it up to 50 percent. And the slide, uh, the final slide in this uh, three series of slides is implantation per age again. We had the implantation uh, using uh, blastocysts derived from donor oocytes uh, in average of 30 percent. We were able to improve this implantation to 43 percent. If you look at the patients under 35, we improved from 36.4 to up more than 50 percent. And if you look at the older patients, we had an implantation prior collapsing of 18 percent and we improved it up to 27 percent. So the next three slides will show you again the clinical, the ongoing uh, pregnancy and the implantation. But here I will show you the day of development. And we look here at the day 5 blastocyst comparing with day 6 blastocyst. And the first two columns shows you day 5 blastocyst and combines all the age groups you saw before. And we had an implantation prior collapsing, uh, a clinical uh, pregnancy of 48% we were able to improve this, implant, uh, this clinical pregnancy close to 69%. If we take again a look at the good prognosis patient population younger than 35 using day 5 uh, vitrified blastocysts, before we had a clinical pregnancy of 51.3 and now we were able to increase this to more than 70% 70, uh, 70 exactly to 75%. If you look at day 6, we started with a clinical pregnancy of 36.3 and you saw or you see the difference here we had before uh, 48 uh, and 36.3 percent. We were able to improve this clinical pregnancy from 36.3 up to 48, 58.5. Again, if you look at the younger patients here under 35 using day 6 blastocysts, we had uh, a starting point for clinical pregnancy of 41.2 and we improve this to up to 67.5. Following the clinical, usually we have the ongoing pregnancy again here and you will see the same trend uh, if you compare the yellow to the pink columns you see an improvement, a significant improvement in all uh, groups. We uh, look here at these slides. Again, day five, all ages, we had about 40% ongoing pregnancy. Now we are up to 64. Even in the younger patient population, we were able to improve from about 45 to more than 70 percent. And again, day six, that was actually our concern at the beginning, why we uh, looked into collapsing. We had a starting point of 28.6 and now we are up to 53 percent ongoing pregnancy by implementing this one single step prior vitrification. Again, younger patients under 35 using day six blastocysts. 34.6 at the beginning, now we are up to 65.3. And the final slide again shows you the implantation rate per day of development. And if you look at day 5 blastocysts again, all ages, we started with 36.5. That's actually a good implantation for using frozen embryos, but we were able to increase implantation to up to 50.2%. Again, good prognosis patients uh, we consider under 35, we had a starting point of close to 41 percent, we are now up to 58.3. Day 6, again all ages, we had a starting point of 25.7 for the implantation rate prior collapsing, now we are up to more than 41 percent. 
younger patients under 35, we were able to improve of about 30% starting point to 45.7. These slides uh, shows you uh, a comparison between fresh and warm day 5 transfers. And the yellow column shows you our day 5 uh, outcome in patients younger than 35 and I looked at more than 1200 sites and we have an implantation rate in these younger patient populations using day 5 plus this is fresh of 48 percent, clinic pregnancy of 61 and the ongoing pregnancy 58.5. But now if we look at the frozen cycles using day 5 plastosis in uh, younger patients by implementing assisted collapsing we can improve this to 58 for implantation, 75 for clinical pregnancy and ongoing pregnancy of more than 71 percent. So we already uh, improve our results so much that we do much better with uh, frozen transfers here compared to fresh transfers on day 5. So to conclude uh, my presentation here, artificial collapsing of day 5 and day 6 blastocysts prior to the steps of vitrification is beneficial for all outcome parameters including clinical and ongoing pregnancy rates as well as implantation rate. And that is published in the past and we can confirm based on our numbers with publications. In general, comparing no assisting collapsing with assisting collapsing prior vitrification, an average increase for all ages in regards to clinical 40% up to 58 ongoing pregnancy rates 30% up to 53 and implantation 28 now 41.5 were observed. In regards to day of embryo development comparing no assisted collapsing with assisted collapsing an average increase for day 5 and day 6 were established for the following. The clinical pregnancy for day 5 blastocyst was improved from 48 to 69 percent for day 5, for day 6 blastocysts from 36 to 58.5. So ongoing pregnancy we improved from 39.5 up to 64 using day 5 blastocysts and 28.6 up to 53 for day 6 blastocysts. Implantation rate we improved by implementing artificial collapsing for day 5 blastocysts from 36.5 to 50.2 and for day 6 blastocysts 25.7 up to 41.1. Using a laser the procedure is fast, simple and precise. It's no need for money preloaders, holding pipettes are not needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lieberman. I'll now turn the microphone over to David Wolf, who will moderate the Q&A session. Uh, thank you, Kate. And a warm thank you to our panelists and to all the participants who have joined us in this webinar. We've received a number of questions from participants, and I would invite each of you to also ask any additional questions during this question and answer period. I will read these questions to our panelists, and they will respond to as many as they can. As mentioned, any questions that we do not answer, we will do our best to provide a follow-up uh, via email. For our first question, I would uh, ask it to Dr. Lieberman. You seem to get good results in collapsing across all age groups. Are there any age groups that stand out? Based on our numbers I showed, it's no age group who really stands out in a negative way. A every age group we were able to improve uh, significantly. You maybe uh, realize that our OSI donation uh, outcome uh, is lower when uh, using own oocytes, but that is mostly related uh, because we are very uh, aggressive in transferring less embryos in this patient population. So uh, what we learned from this data, we maybe have to consider in moving on from transferring one embryo only to two. Okay, thank you. The second question for you, Dr. Lieberman, is uh, why is the rate of implantation lower than clinical and ongoing pregnancy rates? Is it calculated differently, for example, per embryo transfer divided by the number of embryos transferred? 
it's calculated by the number of embryos transferred. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, for uh, Tom Kenny, um, the question is, I see how your multipulse feature is useful for a trifectoderm biopsy. Would you use it for assisted hatching as well? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's not cleared for assisted hatching, and I think that uh, you would be advised not to do that, at least not right now. The problems might be that, especially if you were not using a manipulator, uh, the laser in a multipulse uh, mode would tend to pull the embryo towards the laser. So you could end up, you, you wouldn't have good control over uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, you might apply more heat than you wanted to. I'm not sure if anybody is uh, doing any research on this. It's certainly um, an area which uh, could use some investigation. But as far as uh, right now, the multipulse is um, really designed to be used for trifecta drum biopsy. Uh, and not laser assist attaching. It would be good to know if anybody wanted to do some uh, investigation into that, though. Okay, thank you. And then a question for uh, Dr. Lieberman. You said that no manipulator is needed, but to hold a blastocyst, you need a manipulator to which the holding pipette is attached. Could you explain that? Um, it is, if we uh, collapse them, uh, it's actually, you can use a holding pipette, but usually we don't uh, put in a holding pipette. We put the blastocyst uh, in the solution, in the culture dish, on the microscope, and then we perform a shot, one single shot. So it's no need to hold these blastocysts. They stay in place during you apply the shot. Mm -hmm. And, and then another question for Dr. Lieberman. Do you re routinely do assisted hatching after warming? We do routinely assisting hatching on all blastocysts uh, except they hatch on their own. And this is based on uh, uh, research done by Mark Larman who showed actually that the sauna is changing during cryoprotection, cryopreservation, and uh, that we, we call it sauna hardening. So it takes much longer to dissolve a sauna of embryos by using an enzyme uh, if they were exposed to liquid nitrogen. So I would advise to do this uh, one single step during warming, and we do it during warming, uh, um, during exposing to the sucrose, where the blastocysts are still not fully expanded. So we have plenty of space between the trough ectoderm cells and the sauna pellucida, and we move the dish from our warming or uh, warming bench on the microscope. We uh, opens the sauna, and then we finish a warming procedure. Well, thank you. And then a question for um, Tom Kenny. Um, are the lasers safe for your eyes when looking through the eyepiece? That's a good question. Um, we get that once in a while. They, they are very safe. They're completely safe. Um, the laser, I'm not sure if it's possible to go back to that schematic view, but if you remember the schematic view, the laser beam enters the optical path and heads in the opposite direction from your eyes. Uh, so you remember the light goes, the laser is going up towards the embryo, completely away from your eyes. Um, even if it reflected back, it would reflect off that dichroic mirror and back towards the laser diode, not towards your eyes. And also the laser is um, in the eye safe region uh, wavelength and the power uh, of the laser and the, and the amount of energy that it is um, exerting is actually less than those little red laser pointers that you have. So um, believe it or not, the little red laser pointers are a higher class, a more dangerous class of laser than the uh, uh, Xylos decay or the Lyco. So yes, they're very safe. They're completely safe to look through the eyepieces while you're firing the laser. Thank you. And the questions are coming fast and furious now. Uh, so one for Dr. Uh, Lieberman. Obviously a single, single laser pulse for assisted collapsing prior to vitrification is ideal. But do you have any need to use a second pulse to successfully collapse the blastocyst? If so, do you see any negative effects from this? Um, that's a very good question. I would say in more than 90, 95 percent, a single shot, a single pulse is, uh, is enough because if you take them out of the incubator five to ten minutes, they collapsed. Some of these blastocysts, they still not collapsed when we go back and apply a second shot. And it looks to me that we don't do any harm by applying this second but necessary shot. 
Okay, thank you. And then I have two questions that are somewhat related uh, for Dr. Lieberman. And the first question is, is the vitrification solution made in-house or is this commercially available? Uh, this solution is, I mentioned that in my talk, is uh, commercially available. We did in-house for many years. Um, we produce it in-house, but since 2007 we decided to go commercial and we buy it from Urban Scientific. Uh, the reason was very simple because it was exactly the same solution we made in-house, but now it's more standardized and so Irvine is the uh, manufacturer, the vendor for the solution we are using. Thank you. And then the related question is, um, is the, the principle of opening drops to each other, is this concept applied to all warming brands or is it just a recommendation by Irvine? Uh, this is, uh, I'm not sure if it's a recommendation by Irvine, but that's how we do. This uh, the way we vitify and warm the blastocysts is not necessarily a recommendation by Irvine. It's based on our experience and how we perform the steps. And for the warming, we uh, prefer to connect the drops for a simple reason to gentle uh, decrease the concentration of sucrose so that the blastocyst don't re-expand too fast and maybe die. Mm -hmm. uh, one more question for you, Dr. Liebman, on the use of the laser. What micropulse rate do you use for blastocyst collapsing? It's about uh, one single shot, full power, 500 microseconds. And then I, I guess a follow-up for, uh, probably better for Tom Kenny, um, what are some of the safe limits on maximum pulses, et cetera, across a variety of applications? Um, well, I think for zona breaching or, or making the holes in the zona, it's always better to use uh, multiple small pulses as opposed to using one large pulse. Uh, so you can imagine, um, thinking back to those isotherm rings, if you were to use one large pulse, the heat would extend inward towards the um, blastomeres or, or uh, cells inside the uh, embryo uh, further with a single pulse, but if you use a few small pulses. So typically people will start I in the lowest range at about 150 microseconds, uh, but typically work in the 200 to 500 microsecond range for each pulse, uh, and again take small pulses, and that would be for breaching the uh, zona. Um, for the, and that's the same for whether you're doing assisted hatching or if you're doing um, day three biopsy. For trifectoderm uh, biopsy where you're trying to uh, loosen the gap junctions, I've had people tell me that they use very, very low energy, um, short pulses. Uh, some people use a very low energy and um, longer pulses uh, or, or high energy. Um, I really think that um, uh, the jury's still out on that as far as what, uh, what uh, works best. I would say try to use the lowest energy required uh, to actually get the job done. So um, you obviously don't want to use a, a lot of extra uh, laser energy to um, separate those gap junctions uh, than is needed. But uh, I, again, probably in the two to 500 uh, microsecond range is, is where I've heard people use it the most. Thank you. And then a question for Dr. Lieberman. Um, after how, um, after how long should we wait to transfer embryos after warming? Um, we have a couple of experience on this and when we started uh, forming the blastocysts, we always did it on the same day. We never fought them the day before, kept them overnight. We never did this. But at the beginning we had about four hours to five hours. Now we are down to sometimes one hour, but I would say in average because sometimes you have delays in doing other procedures. Uh, from the side of the physicians. We have it about one to two hours prior transfer we for and warm the blastocysts. Thank you. I'm just scanning our questions. We have a lot of them trying to find some related questions. If I could, it's, it's somewhat similar. What, the question is, what do you think about the day to perform the assisted hatching to biopsy? Uh, day three, day five, and I guess day six as well. Uh, for fresh transfers or for cryopreserved embryos? Uh, the question doesn't say, so let's assume it's <laughs> maybe you can answer for both. Um, we, okay, so uh, we, we hatch every embryos fresh if we perform a day three transfer. We never hatched on uh, day five 
blastocysts coming out of a fresh transfer. It's no need, except we have early blastocysts or sometimes compacting embryos. But blastocysts, food expanded, fresh transfer is no need to hatch them. In terms of frozen embryos, I would recommend, of course, to hatch everything, except you vitify a blastocyst that hatched on their own already. Thank you. And then the uh, a related question, does the pre-collapsed blastocyst that is vitrified expand again normally after warming? They expand very normally. They look awesome. They look nice. They look never like cryopreserved. They uh, re-expand a little bit uh, slower, actually, when the blastocyst be never artificially collapsed, but they look nice, full expanded, until uh, you will perform the transfer. Okay, thank you. And a question for uh, Tom Kenny. Other lasers published at the operator 1480 nanometers and yours is at 1460. What's the difference? Uh, that's a good question as well. Um, 1480, in fact, we used to use 1480 in our lasers. Uh, that was a wavelength which is available for fiber optic communication. So those diodes, uh, laser diodes were uh, designed and uh, made to operate to pump energy into fiber optic communications. But um, in reality, the peak of that water absorption curve where heat is um, absorbed from uh, this uh, laser is actually about 1450. So we want it to be uh, just around 1450 or above typically uh, so we move there because you get a better effect for applying less energy. So at 1450 to 1460, you can actually get uh, more heating effect by, by applying less energy from the laser. So you don't need quite as much um, power out to um, get the job done. Good question. Thank you. And then for Dr. Um, Lieberman, uh, the question is, what device are you using? I assume that question is asking if you, for your laser, are you using the, the Xylos or the Lycos laser? Yeah, I showed it in my presentation to maybe somebody joined us uh, later. We use still as a, a silos since 2004. Uh, we have two silos, but we also consider at least to get one uh, Lycos in the future, especially very helpful in doing trophector dam biopsies. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to ask a few more questions in the interests of time. And one question is, what is the needle diameter that you prefer during blastocyst biopsy? Um, we usually you get like 30 micron. We went down to a customized uh, pipette uh, from Imagine about 20 micron. Okay. Uh, one additional question again for Dr. Lieberman. While collapsing, is it correct that you essentially make two holes with one pulse, i.e. an entry and an exit hole? Is there any concern with trapping of the embryo during the hatching phase? Um, yeah, you definitely, uh, as we showed or we saw by Tom Kelly, uh, a slide where a single pulse was applied, uh, we definitely will have that, uh, but we don't see any issues with collapsing. And you no know, more important, we see good outcome parameters, we see good ongoing pregnancies and clinical pregnancies. We don't see any monozygote twins. Uh, we see twin rates, but that's because we transfer two blastocysts. So based on the ongoing pregnancies, we see uh, using these frozen blastocysts and applying artificial collapsing, I'm not concerned. Okay. And then uh, our next to last question, the follow-up on the what device are you using? It turns out they were asking what device you're using for freezing. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we use um, we use for many years the cryotop, an open system, and uh, because of the ongoing discussion of contamination coming from the liquid nitrogen, uh, even by uh, either by virus or bacteria, we decided to move onto a closed system in 2007, and it's a HSV straw high security vitrification kit. Uh, made and manufactured in France, and the distributor for the United States is Irvine Scientific, based in California. Okay. Uh, and then our final question, um, I'm not sure that I quote you right, but do you collapse blastocysts even for fresh transfers? If yes, what is the idea behind it? Uh, I mentioned that before, we don't uh, collapse uh, fresh blastocysts yes. uh, based on our results again, if you have, and we have uh, two ninety-nine percent day five transfers, food expanded blastocysts, it's no need to collapse them. And we don't hatch them either. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll just make a, a comment that we had a couple of uh, questions about uh, will the presentations be available for review following this and also will the webinar be available. Uh, we will be archiving the webinar so uh, it can be available for viewing afterwards and we'll do our best to provide the presentation for anybody who, who would like it. So please uh, either send an email or ask a note in your question that you would like it. We'll, we'll provide you the presentation. On that note, I'd like to thank our um, panelists again for uh, what I thought was an excellent presentation and a, and, a, and a lively question and answer period, which I also thank our participants. Kate? This concludes our webinar for today. As mentioned earlier, for any questions that we did not get to, we will answer directly through email. If you've missed any portion of the webinar or feel a colleague might benefit from the talk, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar for you to listen to at your convenience. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact them to the appropriate person, Susan Delaney for Hamilton Thorne Laser Systems, and Cindy Rodson for any general webinar questions. Thank you again for your time, and we hope that you can join us for our next educational webinar.